Hello and welcome to this edition of IFS Zooms In, the last of 2020. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Stephanie Flanders, head of Bloomberg Economics, formerly economics editor at the BBC, and most importantly, formerly a colleague of mine at the IFS back in the 1990s. And I think, Stephanie, today we're just going to try and have a bit of a conversation about what's been happening to the economy over the last year and what might be happening next and how the government might respond. Um, but, but Stephanie, maybe it's worth just starting by reflecting on um, just the scale of what we've seen in terms of the economic uh, hit to not just the British economy, but to the world economy. I think it's fair to say that we've never seen anything like this in our lifetimes and indeed probably not in the lifetimes of our parents or indeed our parents' parents. Yeah, it's been a it's been an extraordinary uh, event, and I think you're you're right. I mean, you could you could look back over maybe in twenty thirty years time, um, and think, well, if you just count this as a normal recession, and it all happened over two years or three years, then you could just what you end up with needing to make up in terms of the loss of the economy doesn't look that different. But of course, what's extraordinary about this is it's all been packed into one or two quarters, that extraordinary drop in output. And that caused these extraordinary uh, implications for governments having to really think on their feet, especially governments that didn't have much in the way of a social safety net and didn't have necessarily that tradition of supporting people, certainly of supporting people in employment, um, suddenly had to do an awful lot very quickly. And I guess that's one thing we could say about this is it's not only had an exceptional impact um, on the economy uh, in a very, very short period of time. But we've also seen the fiscal support, the support from government come in record time as well. And I guess we should, if we're coming to the, you know, if we're, if we're look, looking forward and trying to take good things as well as bad from this extraordinary year, I would say the fact that governments, at least across the industrialized economies, were more or less able to fill the hole, if you like, the hole that was blown in the first few months by COVID. Um, that hit to output was not matched by a hit to uh, living standards or income in almost all of those cases, um, at least over the, over the whole of the economy. Uh, what governments were able to put in in the way of support was more or less what COVID was taking out. Now, of course, you will, you know, you've looked very closely at the the, the unequal way that this crisis has hit um, economies and, and households, and we would we'd have to say that it was also exceptional in that, uh, in 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 just the, the extreme inequality of the way that different people have been affected, um, not just in different countries, obviously, but at different parts of the income scale. And that's absolutely right. But across the piece, we'd have to say governments really stepped up at a time when we had previously been wondering, uh, were they going to have room for manoeuvre to support in the, in the, to support the economy in the event of the next crisis? Well, they did. Um, but it has, has left a lot of red ink, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. Absolutely. And it has been, um, I mean, it has been extraordinary the extent to which governments across the world have been able to borrow staggering sums. I mean, we're expecting borrowing in the UK to be approaching 400 billion uh, this year, which is more than twice the peak that we saw back in 2009, 2010, and is indeed the highest borrowing in the UK's history outside of the First and Second World Wars. And the remarkable thing is that governments across the world have been doing the same thing, and they haven't been finding it very difficult to borrow at all. In fact, they've been finding it absurdly easy with interest rates on government debt down at close to zero, and certainly very negative in real um, in real terms. Uh, you know, the UK government's just sold a bunch of debt at minus two, RPI minus two, which means the investors will get half their money back in 40 years time when it's um, ready to be um, redeemed. Uh, and, and quite why you'd, uh, you know, you bet on <laughs> putting your money somewhere and guaranteeing yourself half the money back at the end is, is I think one of the big, for, for me, I mean, slightly uh, one of the big, bigger mysteries of this whole sort of crisis. I mean, what, what what's your view as to why, people are, why governments are finding it so easy to raise such vast sums of money. You know, this is obviously the puzzle of how low interest rates have been for so long and how easy it is for governments to borrow. Of course, it's not just 
um, around COVID. We've seen it even before the global financial crisis. We'd seen that trending down of uh, long-term interest rates around the world. And I think there's some, we know there's some big structural forces behind that. People becoming more risk averse in response to all these financial crises, an enormous amount of supposedly emergency liquidity sloshing around the global economy, all the efforts that central banks took to respond to the global financial crisis that they've had trouble reversing because the economy still seemed to need all that cheap money, Um, all of that sort of come to a head in COVID because you've had once again central banks injecting a lot of liquidity into the economy. I'd say you'd also, my old boss Larry Summers would point to what's become known as the the savings glut, the fact that you structurally have apparently um, a big rise in the desire to save, particularly in those risk-free assets, you know, supposedly government debts, risk-free. structurally a larger part of the global population, particularly in Asia, wanting to invest in these risk-free assets, at the same time as you seem to have a relative decline in the amount of real investment that's needed in the economy. And the way you kind of measure up that that supply, the way you work out that um, cha- relative change in supply and demand in the kind of old-fashioned economics is you end up with money being, uh, those assets being rather rather expensive and not having to charge very much interest to people to get them to buy. So the end result, as you say, is this extraordinary situation where governments are, are uh, in- investors are, are paying governments for the privilege of lending to them um, because they don't want to do anything else with it. But I'm interested, when you look at that extraordinary rise in public debt alongside, as you said, a in many cases, a decline in the cost of servicing that debt. Um, is that? Do you worry that that's just going to change all the arguments around fiscal prudence and and doing the right thing with government money? Are we just are we just going to lose all uh, lose all sense of sort of fiscal reality in the face of these numbers? Well, I don't know. I mean, um, I I think it's one of the concerns in a way of the I mean the up as you say the upside of what we've seen over the last year is that governments have not just been able to respond but have responded to the crisis um, in a way that I think most of us think is appropriate but um, that and that's involved spending hundreds of billions um, I think there's two two issues that arise one is that um, electorates may think well you know, if you can do it this year, why can't you do it next year, the year after, then the year after that? So it may be difficult, even if governments want to return to fiscal prudence, to persuade the population that there is a limit to what's um, possible. But as you as you also suggest, it may be that the limits are much less binding than we thought they were. If um, if it remains the case that um, governments can borrow so incredibly. Cheaply, so are, are there are there risks associated with that? And it seems to me that there are there are at least two risks. I mean, I mean, one um, is is the obvious risk that government will just waste money, and and wasting money is not just about wasting money; it's about wasting resources. Because if you're employing hundreds of thousands of people to build things that are of no value, uh, then um, or, or you know, to provide services that are of no value value, then you're using up resources that could be used more effectively in the rest of the economy. And that is genuinely costly, and that will leave us worse off. Um, So if if you employ people to dig holes and fill them in again, when you could have been employing them to do something useful, then we'll all be worse off in the long run. And I suppose the second worry is that, um, you know, at some point, uh, it's probably not going to be the case that interest rates are so low and that that the world is so happy to um, lend governments money. And we don't know when that point will come. Uh, but when it does come, uh, and it may be in five years' time, but it may be in 20 or 30 years' time, uh, we could be in for really serious problems because we know that when uh, the money dries up and when people stop being willing to lend to governments, then you get really serious problems. And you actually, you know, current government talks about a, a lot about loss of sovereignty, but there's no greater loss of sovereignty than um, not being able to borrow on the world markets and having to call in the IMF or do what uh, the IMF tells you to do, as we discovered back in the late 1970s, as Ireland and Greece discovered um, in the last um, 
in the last crisis. Now, I'm not saying we're anywhere near that, but at some point, you, uh, I mean, that's that's the ultimate risk uh, that you bear. And of course, we're also at the case, at the point where with so much money being held, so much debt being held by the Bank of England, um, any interest rate increase in the short run has an immediate impact on the on the government's budget. So it's one of these things which are really hard to make that judgment about what feels to me sort of um, you know, a small risk of a terrible outcome, and how do you um, how, how how do you weigh uh, the importance of that of, of that small risk? Um, so how the you know in the UK and across the rest of the world, how finance ministers judge those risks and how they move us as I think they need to at some speed, but I don't know what speed towards what looks more like a a sustainable um, fiscal position really is going to be one of the finest and toughest judgments they're going to have, have made in a long while. Yes, although I mean, and the only thing I would say is, I guess every time I raise this, and in fact, we had I have we're warring podcasts because my podcast, Stephanomics, uh, has talked about this at various times. Um, but uh, we did have uh, I had that Charles Goodhart on my podcast the other day, and um, a very uh, wonderful uh, and eminent uh, monetary economist. And as you know, he's uh, he's got a, a a new book where which. It, extends the argument he's been making for for a couple of years um with Manoj Pradhan um about the prospect preparing us for the prospect of inflation returning maybe sooner than we expect and of course that would have a big um that would accelerate the kind of uh, reckoning that you've just uh, talked about and they point to lots of reasonable structural reasons why you might see um more uh, upward pressure on wages and inflation in future years because some of those structural demographics and people wanting to save and all of those things that I just talked about um, are now going into reverse um, slowly because of all these um, young uh, dynamic economies getting older quite quickly. Um, so, But when I raise that to, to central bankers and others, uh, the prospect that we could have inflation sooner than we think, they tend to say, well, that's a nice problem to have. I mean, it has been a long time that we've been waiting for inflation and we've certainly been waiting for wages to go up um for quite a long time and in the short term uh we are once again seemingly facing the opposite risk of more disinflationary pressures uh in many parts of uh the economy and some quite big concerns around how you maintain incomes and and wages especially when we have what looks like um, an acceleration of automation as a result of COVID. You know, I've been sitting, Paul, you know, I've, Bloomberg Economics is economists and reporters who are sitting all around the world. And early on in this crisis, we had a lot of people saying this is the end of globalization and no one's going to want to have supply chains with China anymore. Our experience on the ground of reporters on the ground has not been that. In fact, if anything, we've in recent months, we've had an explosion of trade and lots of container ships piling up, trying to queuing up to get into ports. Even before Brexit, we have people queuing up um, to get into uh, ports across the world. Um, but what has accelerated as a result of this, and we see it everywhere, is automation. Um, people, uh, the greater use of technology, you know, right across um, the economy. Um, I wonder whether you think, if we think that some of the structural changes that we were already concerned about, if only just in the pace at which they were coming, um, things like automation, um, if those have been accelerated as a result of COVID, uh, has anything that the government's been forced to do this year, the sort of innovations that they've done in the welfare system, um, has anything that's happened this year helped us deal with that better? Do you think there are lasting changes to uh, taxes and welfare that either have started to happen this year or might be triggered by this that could actually mean this was an opportunity to do something? Obviously, people talk about Build Back Better, but I wonder just from your perspective on the tax and benefit system, have we got the, have we got the, some, some nuggets or some, uh, have we been nudged to do some good things that might help us in the future? Well, the, um, I mean, the changes that have been made to tax and benefits have in some ways been relatively modest. I mean, the big, the big innovation, of course, was the furlough scheme, which has cost, you know, whatever it is, 60 billion 
pounds or so. Um, I suppose there's a question as to whether something like that, you know, will now remain or be brought brought in more frequently in the future because this is very much the first and only time we've had the government paying 80% of the wages of people who would otherwise be laid off um, and actually even not with a great test as to whether they otherwise would have been laid off. Um, the changes to the welfare system by comparison have been modest but I mean the biggest being a thousand pounds a year increase in universal credit so um, that's a big increase for you know, if you're if you're childless and on universal credit that's a, that's a pretty substantial increase in the value of your benefits it still leaves the British welfare system for childless people out of work very ungenerous relative to what you see in most of Western Europe. Um, it'll be quite interesting to see whether that is maintained. I suppose I think there is, you know, there is a case for maintaining that because you know we've um, the the value of our benefits, out of work benefits, have, have fallen you know, pretty consistently over the last fifty years relative to average earnings because they haven't, you know, they, they've essentially gone up each year in line with prices. Whilst for most of the last fifty years, earnings have risen more quickly. Um, that's not a fundamental change to the system, though. That's just making the system a little bit more generous. I suppose I'm a little bit sceptical as to the need to um, change fundamentally in the face of um, automation. I mean, we have, of course, had, certainly if we look over a 20-year period, we've had a pretty fundamental change to the welfare system in in, in, partly at least in response to lower wages and lower hours, um, though um, there may also be a feedback. People worry that there's a feedback from more generous in-work benefits to lower wages and lower hours as maybe um, employers take advantage um, of that. Now, it is worth remembering that for all of the cuts that have happened to the welfare system over the last decade, it remains massively more generous than it was uh, back at the turn of the century for uh, low-earning families in work with um, with children. Uh, and I think we've now had some more um, you know, pressure uh, to, to make it a bit, you know, to undo some of the cuts that we have seen over the last um, decade. And if the temporary uh, increases we've seen over this year are made permanent, then a lot of those cuts in a different way, will have been um, will have been reversed. Um, I guess I was just sorry. I was just wondering though about if we think that there was a big chunk of the population that was not being served very well, was not really part of the system very well. The self-employed and others had not been fully fully sort of integrated into the system, and then and that was one of the big issues that the Treasury faced: is how do we help self-employed people without? Um, being without doing it in an incredibly untargeted and unfair uh, way, and will this be maybe a spur to having the welfare system work better for that? What is inevitably going to be a rising share of the population? Well, I think it should be. I think it's a really good question. I think you know that possibly the biggest failure of government in the last year in terms of responding to the crisis has been the self-employment income support scheme. The sort of self-employed version of the furlough scheme, um, which has been incredibly badly targeted. So there are, you know, frankly, there are a significant group of the self-employed who have coined it in um, because they, you know, they've been provided with uh, large subsidies, even when their incomes haven't gone down very much. And there's been another you know, very substantial group um, who've been effectively abandoned, who have, um, you know, who, who, who have seen all of their income go and have had no support from government. Um, some of those who are on somewhat higher earnings, some of those who are newly self-employed, some of those who are who are incorporated rather than um, formally self-employed. So, 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 so the, the response of government has been very, very um, uh, blunderbuss, really, um, you know, helping some far more than they should and, um, and, 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 and abandoning many others. And I think that reflects something about the in, whole way that our labor market and welfare system works as you're as you're intimating it, it, it really doesn't work very well for the self-employed it's if you're an employee then government has a lot of information about you through the payee system and hmrc records and so on so they know how much you're earning and when you lose your job it's very obvious that you've lost your job um, and you can get out of work um, benefits or in this case furlough 
because they're self-employed and not part of the PAYE system, because it's um, you know, because their incomes are self-reported rather than reported by their employers, uh, it's, mu- it's genuinely much harder for governments to um, provide them with uh, with welfare support. I, I mean, I, I said this to the Treasury Select Committee a couple of weeks ago that I think uh, you know a, a, a big priority for for government is then is then to work out how to treat the self-employed in the tax and welfare system going forward. Are there ways of making it more automatically clear what the what their incomes are, um, what their what their earnings are, and then um, you treat them more like uh, more like employees as we go forward? I think that is a big shift and. And of course, a big fraction of the increase in employment over the last decade has been among the self-employed. So we we talk a lot about how well the British labour market has done in the sense of very low levels of unemployment and high levels of people in work. But uh, but a big fraction of that uh, increase in numbers in work has been among the self-employed who themselves have seen um, even worse earnings um, uh, performance than employees. I mean, employees have had a terrible decade uh, in the sense that their earnings on average are not much more now than they were back in 2008. But for the self-employed, their earnings today on average are con- still considerably less than they were back in 2008. And that's not just because of all the new ones coming in. Even those who are long-term self-employed have seen their uh, their incomes go down. So I think, that, I think you're right. That is part of a kind of shift in the way that the labour markets, um, in the way that labour markets being working, and I think it's a, it, it, I don't see, frankly, um, any very strong ideas from within government about how to deal with this at the moment. If we think about uh, the sort of longer term uh, things that we might get out of this, it often feels like um, there's a wonderful phrase. Robert McFarlane, the writer, has a, a book about called Underland. Uh, that talks about all the different ways that we our relationship with this earth, which I won't go into, but he has a great phrase uh, called uh, un- when he talks about things being unburied and unburials, and that is used in the context of things in the nor- near the North Pole or in the Arctic Circle that were thought to be buried for hundreds of years. People thought they were never going to see them again, and they they get unburied by global warming. They come out of the of, of the earth. Um, and it feels a bit like COVID has unburied uh, quite a lot of, brought to the surface a lot of things that we sort of knew were structural weaknesses in our economic model, whether it's, um, you know, extremely centralised government, not very kind of well-developed relationship between localities and the centre, um, cities and towns not really given very much room for manoeuvre and not really working very closely with with people in Whitehall. This dependence, the, as you say, the structural change that's happened in the labour market where we've been very dependent on quite insecure, low-paid labour, a lot of it in the service sector, a lot of it in the centre of cities because that was the sort of one development strategy that cities and towns were, have, were following um, over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And all of and, and that and, and the extreme inequality, social and economic inequalities, which we have seen also come through on the health inequalities, the very unequal way that COVID has has hit um, different parts of, of the population. Um, given all that, I wonder if we were, if we're thinking over the next few years that there will be tax and benefit changes that will be needed, tax and spending changes, um, maybe we, we're not going to be trying to rain back 20% of GDP's worth of borrowing. It may only be a few percentage points, but it's certainly we're going to need some kind of money raising over some period of time. Um, where, What do you think are the, are the, the lessons of this, of this crisis and of the, those weaknesses in our economic model um, would point in the way of um, the kind of policies that the government should be thinking about. I mean, we we do we think of it in terms of the contrast with the years of austerity after twenty ten, um, but I think it goes it goes deeper than that. Um, you know, should we be thinking more about taxing wealth, given that those who have wealth have done so well this year <laughs> relative to those who who live on their incomes? I'm just sort of wondering what what you're thinking about that, regardless of whether it will happen. Um, what would be good starting points? <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I think I mean you're you're you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the um, you know the this crisis has really you know I mean, uncovered is possibly putting it too strongly, but certainly shone a br- an even brighter light on uh, a lot of the inequalities that we've um, we, we, we've been facing. It's very very you know who 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 have, who have been the big losers on average? They've been people on low pay, uh, people in less good housing, uh, younger people, uh, people coming out of education, uh, ethnic minorities. Um, so it, all, all of the groups who were previously disadvantaged, as it were, um, have done even worse through um, uh, through this crisis. And at least in a financial point of view, again, you're you're right. And I think this points to uh, one important policy issue: is that, as you say, those who had wealth to start with have done relatively well. Um, uh, and if you look back at the last decade, I mean, one reason that those who you know, had wealth at the beginning of this century have done well is that, uh, to go back to what we were saying a few minutes ago, interest rates have been extraordinarily low. Um, we've had another bout of interest rate cuts and quantitative easing, which is holding up asset prices further. Uh, and I think it's my view that one of the, you know, I mean, the big people, when people talk about house prices, um, people talk about lack of building being, you know, the, the, the key determinant of house prices. But I'm pretty convinced that actually a lot of the increase in house prices has been driven by the sort of the secular decline in interest rates over a long period. And that has been a particular advantage to a particular generation and a particular group of people. Um, and if you look again at policy over the last 10 years, that group which has been advantaged by monetary policy is also the group that's been advantaged by government fiscal policy. So um, those who had um, you know, good occupational pensions and 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 were ha- homeowners um, have also been supported. Uh, they've certainly been supported by lower interest rates, but they've also been supported by the fact that the period of austerity was a period of austerity for people in work, but not a period of austerity for the older generation. So I think the first... You know, the first thing to look at you know, really quite seriously is is what can government do to um, sort of right that wrong, I think, uh, in the sense that um, you, you've got a group who have done well, and let's be clear, at the expense of another group for reasons that I do not think were intended. Um, I don't think it was intended uh, that, um, you know, house, housing you know, should become so concentrated in one generation, nor I think was it intended uh, that occupational pensions should be, you know, incredibly generous for one generation, and then the next generation sort of effectively pays for them and is shut out of them. Uh, so I think that will be the first, you know, first set of places to look: is can you do something which is more generationally just? Um, uh, and uh, but also then I think you need to look at what the longer term consequences are because of course this wealth in housing and pensions is not it's not the whole of the older generation that has it it's unequally distributed within uh, that generation and therefore will flow down to the next generation in an unequal um in an unequal way and and, and work we've done at ifs and lots of other work suggests that inheritance is going to become you and what well, it was, has already become and is increasingly becoming a, a more important part of the lifetime income and wealth of the younger generation in a way that we haven't seen in decades. And, uh, you know, we're not quite returning to Victorian times and sort of the novels of um, you know, Jane Austen or whatever, which, of course, pre-Victorian. But, um, uh, you know, we are certainly moving to a world in which the, that, that, that holding of wealth and that ability to send wealth gener- down the generations is, is increasingly important. And that points towards um, you know, policies which, I mean, if not um, sort of a straightforward wealth tax, certainly um, in making uh, pension taxation more sensible, um, taxing sort of occupational pensions in retirement more sensibly than we do at the moment, um, certainly having a sort of rational council tax, which taxes according to the you know, value of the property rather than regressively with regard to the value of the property 30 years ago, um, capital gains tax that actually uh, works um Properly, uh, and you know, and, and other and, and other policies of of that kind. So that that's that, that that's the sort of I think in, for the long run, that's the big social sort of unintended consequence of policies that we've followed. Not just over the you know, not just been revealed by this crisis, but we've policies we've seen over the last twenty years, and there've been 
further revealed by this crisis and will be further exacerbated by the fact that um, we've now got whatever it is, a trillion pounds worth of quantitative easing and interest rates at essentially zero. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, that, 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 that's where I would look first for, you know, ex- at least how to frame uh, a policy response in a way that is, um, you know, is, is more equitable than we've seen. I mean, you say it was inadvertent, this generational injustice. I guess many people, or, or and indeed that the weighting in favour of property over any kind of anything else, the undertaxing of it and the um, enormous benefit that house prices have had from, from low interest rates. Of course, many people would point to decades of government policies on both sides, um, but perhaps given particular impetus um, by conservative support for house buying and more cheap mortgages over the years um that every effort has been made to make that britain's main source of saving and building up of wealth and that was inevitably going to produce the kind of generation inequalities i mean people have known about even something as basic as the need to revalue properties for council tax for local property taxation um, for many, many, many years. And the longer it's left, the harder it is for the next government to do because of the big, you know, it becomes a very difficult thing when it might have been quite easy if it happened every few years. Um, so I, I do wonder, I wonder whether we'll see such a change of heart from a, from a government that has has pretty has has towed the line has even tr- has even spurred another round of house price rises this summer in in part of its uh, um, response to COVID by uh, giving allowing the the stamp duty holiday and various things which by all accounts um, did trigger a, a big a, a mini boom uh, in the parts of the UK where there was idle money looking for places to go as a result of this crisis. Well, I think yeah, I think that point about idle money is important, though. And it, I mean, I, I just wanted to come back to you about um, you know part of what Charles Goodhart's been saying because it, it was one of the things I wanted to, to talk about. So, there, I mean, there is a lot of idle money now. Um, you know, we know that uh, you know, whilst large fraction of the population has suffered financially over this crisis, another large fraction hasn't been able to spend and has built up you know quite a lot of money in bank accounts. Um, so that could well trigger another bout of asset inflation. But I do wonder whether, um, you know, alongside all of the other things that Charles Goodhart points to, I mean, how much do you think that there is a, a real risk of um, inflation uh, taking off? Because, you know, instinctively, one looks at, you know, zero interest rates, trillion pounds of quantitative easing, a whole pile of money sloshing around in people's bank accounts, possibly supply uh, constraints in global trade, possible effects of Brexit and so on. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel difficult to me to paint a scenario in which inflation is well above Bank of England target over the next few years. Is that, is that something that worries you? I, think it, I do think it's perfectly possible. Um, and in fact, our economist did some numbers. If you believe that this big expansion in the money supply uh, needs to end up somewhere uh, and ends up and has to be absorbed somehow in prices going up you know following the kind of milton friedman of inflation there's everywhere a monetary phenomenon they just they may make the assumption that all this money uh, that has just this year the extra expansion that's happened of central bank balance sheets you know printing all this money it hasn't caused inflation, obviously, because we know that it's not going around the economy as fast as it might have done previously. And it's it's sitting in all these uh, sort of safety, people building up safety buffers in various accounts and things. There's lots of this sort of liquidity sitting around not doing anything, which is why we haven't got inflation. But if you assume that we just go back to that quite slow rate of circulation that we had um, before 2020, um, the years we've had since the global financial crisis, where, by the way, there was still a lot more sort of money sitting around on bank accounts than there had been previously and a lot lower speed of circulation around the economy. But if you just go back to that already quite unusually slow circulation, you would still be looking at a 30 percentage points increase in the price level <laughs> over the next um, few years just to account for that, just just to absorb the extra um, money that's going into the economy over the last few years. Now, of course, um, other things could happen to absorb that or to counteract that. You could have interest rates go up significantly and that would offset that and you could have the central banks 
sucking back um, some of that liquidity, selling back the bonds that it's bought of government government debt uh, into the market rather than, as you say, sitting on all these stocks of, of public debt. There's lots of things that could happen, but we know that all of those things um, would turn the financial market's expectations upside down. You look at um, you mentioned earlier the the negative interest rates, the fact that investors are paying governments like the UK, like Germany, like even Italy, um, for the privilege of lending to them. That uh, willingness to lend at those rates is built on an assumption that inflation is going nowhere for a really long time. Um, if those, if it starts to look like it's not so much will inflation go so high, it's if it starts to look like central banks are going to have to deal with some inflation. You don't need inflation to soar to have a wholesale reckoning happen in the global financial markets where suddenly all those bonds suddenly look like a very bad deal. Um, and by the way, then suddenly a lot of people's pension funds will look a lot worse <laughs> because um, the value of those bonds will have gone down enormously um, when, they're, when they're resold. So I think um, I'm not so worried about inflation really taking off. I am quite worried about you know, the, the, the assumptions about future inflation are now so extreme and there is so little inflation that anybody sees anywhere on the horizon, even to a sort of 10 or 20 year horizon in some cases, that it wouldn't take much uh, to really change um, valuations in markets and present central banks and financial regulators with a pretty big problem. So, you know, I would buy some of the things that Charles Goodhart says in the way of the structural forces that are happening. I think having had 20 or 30 years of these forces that support low inflation, you know, which we've seen, for example, come through in all these you know, the cheap goods that come from China because China's got lots of cheap labor. Well, all of that is, as we know, a lot of those things, um, the aging of the population around the world, all of that worked in favor of there being more savings around, in favor of there being more cheap goods around. I buy his argument that we're now on the downward side of that hill, that we're going to have people go from their high savings years to their retirement years and their spending years, relatively speaking, in places like China. We're going to go to times when there's shrinking labor force, certainly shrinking unskilled labor force, um, which potentially could push up wages rather than this sort of ocean of cheap labor that we've had all these years. All of those things, I think, are going into reverse, but we'd expect that to affect inflation quite slowly. What could affect our world right now is if you have a very quick reassessment by financial markets of that long-term prospect. And that does that does worry me a bit. And I don't think we're very well prepared for that. You know, people can talk to point to Japan and say, well, Japan's had um you know, is 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 a uh, way ahead of us in terms of the aging of its population, in terms of all of these forces. But they got to do that at a time when everybody else was still young, when there were still lots of disinflationary forces around, and still all this cheap labour that they were importing in cheap goods from China and everywhere else. Once we're all on that downward curve, in terms of our labour force and um, the amount of people. Um, that the number of people that uh, who are retired now going up, um, I think you know you could have quite a significant change in the outlook, which happens takes longer than we expect to happen, and then happens much quicker um, once it starts to happen. You've mentioned China, and I just wanted to sort of zoom out to sort of a global perspective. I mean, when we think about a lot of the impacts of COVID in the UK, we're talking about in the long run, things that might have accelerated things that were happening anyway, and sort of maybe the demise of the parts of the high street, the sort of uh, the, the, the shining a light on um, inequalities that were pre-existing and maybe leading to some of them becoming bigger, quicker, or us doing something more about them quicker. But what do you think when you look at the sort of world um, economy? I mean, we, we, we it appears that uh, we've got, in broad terms, a crisis to which the East, the, the the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans have responded much more effectively than the West. Um, do you see this as a sort of the moment when we realise that the sort of, you know, to put this at its most sort of a, a high level, um, the sort of West's dominance has finally ended and this is the this is the moment when 
when the East, as it were, really is, it really has got to that point where it's the it, it's the economic and political powerhouse. I think, I mean, you obviously have a have a point there. We actually did, the Economist have done some analysis at Bloomberg about uh, who won COVID and why. And we just looked at some of the underlying conditions of countries um, going into this and how well that predicted how um, the the balance of not just the economic costs, but the public health costs of, of COVID. And it is obviously very striking that the more, the non-democracies, the kind of more authoritarian governments, many of them in Asia, um, have uh, come out of this much better, um, not just on the health front, but also on the economic front. China, I think, is going to be the only major economy in the world uh, to grow this year. I mean, that's a testament to really has managed a V-shaped recovery. And that is inevitably um, going to accelerate this um, rise or you, some would many the historians would say return of Asia to its plate rightful place as a major share of the of the global economy. Um, I think depending on which way you do the numbers, I think the IMF has done this. You know that it's maybe gained four or five years in terms of how soon it might expect to overtake um, the US. Not in, in not just in the terms that we currently talk about purchasing power parity, but in 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 absolute terms as well, or the other way around. Um, but I think so. It's accelerated. Uh, China's uh, rise to become um, the largest economy in the world. Uh, And it's also shown us uh, the advantages when it comes to pandemics. There are advantages to being able to tell all the countries, tell everyone in the country to do something and they listen. But I think we shouldn't forget that there have been some uh, industrialised democracies who have done very well, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Germany, you know, many of these countries look quite good relative to the likes of the UK and US when you look at those trade-offs. Um, what is uh, seems to explain what's happened better than anything, actually, is trust in government. And if you have trust, if you have underlying trust in government, then you didn't have to be rich uh, and you didn't even have to be authoritarian to actually get some pretty good um, outcomes, and that's true when you look at uh, Vietnam, you look at other places. So, so I think you're right. It has accelerated the relative rise of Asia. Um, this crisis, because of its particular, in part because of its particular characteristics, it's favoured um, character underlying characteristics of economies, including faith in government, that uh, are and a kind of social cohesiveness that turned out to be very useful for responding to this crisis. But I'm not sure we have to be completely um, uh, downbeat about the implications for so-called Western models, because we have seen uh, certainly vaccine development has been extraordinary. And I think by and large has, has come, has come from the West that came together uh, very well. I think we also, the same questions we might've had in the past about the ability for a very authoritarian um, country that's not democratic and does not encourage kind of individualism is that those, the kinds of countries that are going to do well in an era where you're very dependent on innovation and serving consumers effectively. It could be, it could be. Uh, and there's parts of the Chinese of Chinese industry that are absolutely at the cutting edge. But there's also a lot of areas where the Chinese government has invested and tried to do well um, and actually have not managed to, to emulate the success of, of US companies. So I think it's not... It's not um, all is not lost, but I think you're quite right in this. If you looked back from a sort of historical sweep, this is this has taken um, Asia and certainly China several steps ahead of where it might have been um, at the end of 2020. So, um, so what next for what next for the UK? I guess. I mean, we are. Um, I mean, let's uh, let's assume that um, the vaccine broadly works and um, we can return to something like normality by spring summer of 2021 um how do you expect the how do you expect the government to respond economically um and don't forget of course in a world in which we'll be outside of the eu um we're recording this not 
still not knowing whether there's going to be a deal <laughs> or not, but uh, we know... You know even that could be true for some time. That could be true for some time. <laughs> and even if we get a deal, we know it's going to be a pretty thin one. So we'll be in you know, very different trading relationships with the rest of the EU. And how do you see... How do you see Rishi Sunak's budgets? Um, you know, I assume, I assume we'll get a couple in 2021. What's he going to be trying to achieve now? Well, I think it's almost, I mean, there's two different questions there. There's sort of where's the UK going to go and where's the UK economy going to go? And then how is how is the Chancellor going to prioritise and what's, how is he going to respond? I mean, I think on the, 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 the it's it turned out to be, as with everything to do with Brexit, uh, extraordinary timing. Um, but in all these, in all the um, most of the most of the timing since we had uh, the referendum has been bad. We've often found, you know, it was a bad time for the central for Bank of England governor to re- to retire. So Mark Carney stayed on for ages, and then he still ended up leaving at a really <laughs> crucial time. Um, we've had you know constant deadlines and uh, things coming at the wrong time. But I would say that this. Uh, Britain moving away from the from the moving out of the transition period into whatever very thin or non-existent arrangement we have with the EU has come at quite a good time um certainly for those who would want to downplay the economic consequences of Brexit because we are going to inevitably have a sharp rebound in the economy over the next 6 to 9 months um as we've talked about a lot of pent up spending that people want to do. I suspect there will be many holidays. I suspect the likes of EasyJet, at least in the short term, are going to do extremely well. We just we know from almost from our own experience how much people are desperate um, to to go back. Now they don't necessarily go and have four holidays to make up for the two that they didn't have this year, but they will certainly be um, that kind of um, bounce back. And that is going to more or less coincide with the period where we may have um, quite a lot of chaos or it's certainly big transition issues at the ports and maybe businesses all over the UK realising that they are implicated in this change that they thought that was going to um, not affect them you know, in terms of discovering that they have to catalogue individually every input that they get from, from Europe when previously they just were able to use the same um, standards as um, and the same approaches as that were for across across Europe. So I think there's lots of ways that the micro consequences of Brexit will be felt, but it's all going to be drowned out by this big sort of macroeconomic um, resurgence um, that will that one would hope would inevitably come, having lost such a large chunk of GDP um, earlier in in 2020. In terms of Rishi Sunak, I should ask you, I mean, I, my, I, I'm a little nervous given our previous conversations about how much breathing room the government probably has in terms of its being able to maintain quite a high level of borrowing for very low debt service costs. Um, that he has already, that the Rishi Sunak has already set the agenda um, to be moving in the direction of squeezing um, spending raising taxes, cutting borrowing sooner than many economists would have suggested. Um, so I certainly hope in the first half of next year that we don't get um, much conversation around that. And instead, we're still talking about how we can support um, areas that will have been affected by by the move out of the transition arrangements, um, manufacturing parts of the country that maybe really quite hard hit by the effect on the supply chain. I hope that we're still talking about that and that uh, Rishi is still innovating in a supportive direction through 2021. Um, but I fear, given his rhetoric so far, that they will be he'll be moving us more in the direction of, of cuts. But what do you think? Yeah, I think my instinct is, is, is rather similar to yours. I mean, I was, I have to say, I was... Um, I was astonished, actually, that um, over the sort of August September period of this year, we had all this apparent briefing from the Treasury suggesting he was thinking about tax rises in an autumn budget. Um, you know, given the levels of uncertainty facing the economy and the um, the need to continue support, I also think it would be a mistake to be you know doing a significant amount of. Uh, fiscal consolidation in the next financial year. So I, I, I don't think that the March budget ought to be announcing big tax rises for 2021 um, because there's so much uncertainty in the economy um, and we know that we can continue to borrow for now. Uh, but clearly we are going to have to get on a sustainable path at some point. And the, you know, as I said 
almost, I think, at the beginning of this discussion, I think that you know, judging what that point is 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 going to be really tough. So I would, I would expect maybe if there is an autumn budget next year, I would expect and hope at that point that we'll at least get some kind of um, framework or plan for uh, reining in what looks like it will continue to be a very large deficit indeed. Um, I guess the politics of this are that if we are going to be, you know, if it does turn out that we need substantial tax rises, and I think, um, you know, more likely than not we will, um, I think the politics of this are probably uh, that the big elements of that will come after whenever the next election is, sort of in the mid-2020s. And that might actually not be bad economics either, um, because I think there is a danger, as you say, of doing things too quickly. Um, so I think if we start um, to lay out the framework during next year, um, do something, uh, do something gentle to kind of keep a cap on borrowing over the next two or three years, and then really start to be, you know, putting up, you know, taxes, which I think, as I say, we'll have to do at some point in the second half of this decade or around the middle of this decade. Um, that might that might work quite well. Of course, the risk is that you know if you leave it another four or five years who knows what the next crisis will be that comes down uh that comes down the road uh but at the moment i would um i'd be surprised if there's a big fiscal consolidation in the next financial year um uh because i think the risks around it are um you know given uncertainties around brexit given uncertainties around the recovery from the uh, the virus, given the uncertainties around um, you know, the global situation, I think it will be it, it will be difficult to make really big tax rises at that point. So I guess at the end of 2020, of all years, we should be cautious in feeling we know anything at all about what might happen in the next 12 months. Yeah, if, if, yes, I don't think um, you know, no, no one predicted this year <laughs> a year ago. So goodness knows what the next year has to hold. Um, but on that uh, on that note of um, humility and uncertainty, perhaps it's time that we brought this uh, this conversation to an end. We could have gone on for hours because there are so many things <laughs> that we, uh, we 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 could have we could have talked more about. I'd have loved to have um, talked more about uh, you know the, the the world economy and, uh, and and inflation as well as regional economies within the UK um, uh, inequality. Um, and you know what particular tax rises we might be looking forward to, but um, those will be subjects, no doubt, for future. Only, only the head of the IFS could talk about looking forward to tax rises, but I think I know what you mean. Uh, looking forward to talking about tax rises. <laughs> looking forward to talking about. Uh, um, but uh, well, we have the whole of next year to talk about that in um, in, in future editions. Stephanie, it's been absolutely fantastic um, talking to you and uh, across such a wide. Uh, such a wide canvas, um, which, of course, 2020 has provided us um, with. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. It's like going back to Ridgemount Street IFS all those years ago. <laughs> and thank you all for listening. If you did enjoy this um, episode, please hit subscribe and rate us. And you can always stay on top of our latest work by visiting www.ifs.org.uk. Stay well, and we look forward to speaking to you again soon.